Yeah. Or, or you're just making the tea. Everybody's job is important. Yeah. The light people are important. The sound people. Everybody's important. And that's what they. Even they just do. putting the cup on the right table at the right place, isn't it, John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's job is important. The group here didn't know me from Adam. They only know, knew me through Danny's recommendation, and I was delighted. <laughs> Yeah. And she about my ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it was a delight. Everything, every minute was a surprise. Every sound was a surprise. It was so fast. Yeah. Yeah. I know who everybody is, uh, starting from the, in the front on the left. You are Rory Oldeskin. And Dennis uh, Widdles. Rory and Dennis. And at the back. Tom, Tom Hackner. Tom. Rory, Dennis, Tom. Ty O'Keefe. Okay. So starting with Rory, could you tell us who you are and what your association is with the event? Well, uh, I'm, I'm the chairman of the Glint Theatre here at the moment, right, for the past number of years. And uh, as, uh, do you want me to talk about the Glint now as uh, uh, such you do? Well, the Glint Theatre, first of all, as you can see, it was an old school. And it was built back in 1840 and opened in 1841. And it remained a school until 1975. Uh, for the intervening years between, between it being a school and it, and it opening up as a theatre, it was being used by the farmer across the way here f as a store for cattle and a store for his father. A gentleman, uh, Jim Eldridge was his name, arrived in this area. He was a scriptwriter with the BBC and he was writing Carnation Street and things like that and he lived over the road. And around 1991 or two, he mentioned to one or two of us about this building that would make a lovely theatre. And he said, is there any way of getting our hands in that place? So a committee was set up then, and they approached the local farmer. It was bought back from him in about 1994. Put 25,000 pounds at the time. A few of us signed our name and got a loan from the local credit union. And we started, we started doing it up. And there was a lot of voluntary labour, and we got a lot of people to donate money to buy one of the seats here. Their names are up there at my left hand side. And uh, they cost in the region about 20,000 at the time, these seats, yeah, back in, in 1994, 95. So um, um, from there then, we started looking for shows, artists to, to, to fill the place. And we can give you a list of all the different artists that have been here down through the years if you want to. Well, just maybe a couple of, of, of them. Well, if you take it, we, we, we have been involved, you see, with, we'd say, with the likes of uh, some of our top singing artists now in the country. Eleanor Shanley. Brendan Grace. Sean Keane. Crystal Swing. Johnny McAvoy. Johnny McAvoy. Tom Fleming. The Furies. American Bluegrass. Yeah. 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 To Brendan Byer. Special Consensus. And to Greg Blake. Uh, bluegrass band there recently. We have comic artists as well and comedians. So we had Tommy Tiernan, we had uh, Brendan Grace, Pat Short, Pat Short John Kinney, uh, what's the name of the lad from Offaly? Um, he's, I just can't. Neil, Neil Delamere, he's right, Neil Delamere, yeah. he has been here as well. So we have had a lot of different things like that. I mean, I mean, Tommy Tiernan, for example, uh, yeah. we ran two, two shows one night with, with, with Tommy Tiernan here. One, one at 7 o'clock, was it? Half yes. seven, one at 10 o'clock. And both of them packed out. Both packed out. There wasn't a, a protest outside. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> that time. They know what they're getting like. Yeah. Did they have a following back in their feet? But that night, uh, Tommy, Tommy arrived that night uh, on, uh, on a motorbike. And he had a plastic bag with him, and, and, and uh, he, he, he wanted to, to, to add one of his, of his uh, t-shirts out, out the back before he went on stage. Yeah. And he, he left to get in his motorbike when, yeah. when it's all finished. Yeah, yeah but we are very lucky. We have one member of our group by the name of Con O'Keefe, he's Tiger's brother actually. And he looks after all the bookings. And he has built up a rapport really with a lot of these guys. And they actually, they love coming back here. Because first of all, Con, is, he has a great way with them. And he treats them properly and fairly, and they know that. And uh, I think they like coming back here. They actually like coming back here. I know Elna Shanley has said it's one of her favourite venues as a small venue. Well, the place, Tiger O'Keefe is the chairman the of the drama group, he's and he's actually, if I can say, he's the man. He was he was there when the drama group came back into being again in 1989. So he has all those years of experience to talk about it. Yeah.
Yeah. Before everybody starts. Yeah. We have like two heaters going in the back, like, and we're like cuddling up to them. <laughs> and, together. Yeah. And then, like, when people come in, like, it just gets very warm then. Okay, just give me one, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Tim. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah. Something like that. Is it? Well, I might say it's, it's, a, it's a big waste of resources to have this as a theater. I wouldn't agree at all. I wouldn't agree at all because, in in modern society and the lifestyle that other people, and no matter what job you have, you have to have a, a somewhere that you can go and laugh, which I think is vital. It's great medicine, and forget your problems. I, it's not going to ease problems that you have, and everybody has a problem, but it'll take you away from that space. I have come in here with bits of problems, and I have forgot, forgotten about them for my two or three hours here. But they're, and they're still there, but I laugh and I'll have a drink in the crack. Not major problems, let me out. The beauty of being on stage, everyone is basically the same. You could be a millionaire, you could be not feeling the best, you could be in ill health, you could be whatever in real life. You could have, the bank could be taking the house off you tomorrow. But if you're coming out and you're playing the part of John Murphy or whatever, right? You're that person for two hours. Mm. You're probably that person for three hours because you're getting into character before it. So really, it doesn't matter what I have. If I'm on stage and I'm acting, and there's another guy across me or Deirdre's across me, it doesn't matter what our standing or our, what's going on in our private lives. The reality is we come in here and you are the character. Mm. And I would say that's really why there is a passion for it. So, you know? yeah, just two years in Kinsale there. I moved down in 2015. Yeah. and. Uh, so yeah, just the two, and um, I had played with. I was a musician, so I played music before with a bit of singing. So yeah. I was used to being in front of people, but I hadn't ever studied acting. So I suppose I kind of got roped in by um, by accident, really. A girl that Anita, that's been in the Glen like for years, and her mom was here before. She actually moved in next door to me, and um, like that one night, she said, "Come on down," and I've been here ever since, really. I just I knew myself. I wanted to try out acting. I wanted to try it. And every time I went to plays, I always saw myself on the other side. And I said I had to give it a go. So um, I have heard about the play from my drama teacher, actually, because she had heard from another woman who's worked in our stage school, Olive, who is John's brother-in-law's wife. So it kind of got passed along down to me from um, the director of my stage school and they, they're like, yeah, they're looking for someone who will be willing to sing. So. I joined Galway Youth Theatre when I was 16 and did a year there. Um, then we moved back to England and I did my A-levels and I took A-level drama. Um, and then I tried to get into acting, not very successfully. Um, and during the process, I met himself. And this happened. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped drinking. <laughs> And I realised that that's all I was doing, and I had all this, these ideas, and I thought I was good at something, but I wasn't getting playing gigs in the music and no money to buy equipment or anything. Uh, the first show we did was in at the end of first year, the first thing I ever did for the public, and after it, my dad came up to me and he said, "Timmy, you found your niche." I was like, "I trust him. On, I trust him on that one. He knows me well enough." So I didn't believe him at the time. It took me another year to actually get it, but uh, yeah, it seems to work. I've done comical parts and uh, more serious parts. I kind of, I possibly myself, I reckon I prefer a more serious role, do you know? That's just myself. But um, we've done a few of uh, John B. Keane's plays now, down through the years, and I got, a, I got a good buzz out of that. There was a lot, there was more in it. I was on stage for longer, and it was just, just that you had to get into the character more, you know, as such. Like. Yeah, so I played with Martin. Martin was doing Chastitute, so I was, um, one of his floozies. <laughs> so, so <laughs> they came you're, you're yeah, I'm fairly fresh off the block, yeah. And what did you, what, what, how did you find it? I found it fairly nerve wracking in the beginning, but um, no, as it went on, like, I, I really did enjoy it. I love the buzz of it. It's great, like, and you know, the work you put into it, rehearsing and everything. And the guys down here are great as well, like, they're so welcoming and so, so nice, like, and there's a great banter and there's great crack out of them, like, so it's, it's great. It's great to be involved so in it. Long term, Glenn, here? No. Nope. No. Nope. This is bought our first uh, 
well, I suppose, active involvement here. Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you know each other? Oh, we, we, we go know back each other. We go way back now. a long way. We do indeed. When the play is over, like, I always find myself when a play is f finished, like, I like the, our musical here now tonight. Um, when this will be over, like, there's, you, you feel your emotions wig, you're at a bit of a low, like, for a long time after it. And you're, you know, and you're just waiting for the next thing to get you going again, you know. But it's definitely a bug, you know. And, uh, and it, I suppose it is like that, looking for that next mountain, the, the play is your next mountain here for us, like. But uh, we don't have it as, as far to fall, but. To have a project, to have something going. I feel at my most comfortable, most relaxed and happiest on stage playing a part, bizarrely. Yeah. Even with live theatre, anything and everything go, go wrong and I love it because you get a thrill from, sometimes you have to think on your feet because sometimes you might forget a line or someone else might forget a line or someone will come in too early or this or that and anything could go wrong and it's exciting. I just love it. I would travel on one leg and hop down if it meant getting a, playing a character, you know. And it, it certainly is a drug. There's no doubt about it. It certainly is a drug. There are nights uh, when you could stay at home. There were nights when we were rehearsing because we have done another play and we're, it's on again, I think, next week. But I'd say there are people here that since the 1st of January, you could count maybe in two hands the amount of nights they were at home. I just couldn't walk on, say a few lines and walk off again. Do you know what I mean? Like, and like, Sometimes you, sometimes it'll work, it'll work that way, and like you just can't get into it. You haven't got the energy for it, like. But you know it. You know you haven't the energy that night and whatever, like. But the next night you're gonna really keep it because you're gonna say that that can't happen again, like. A lot of people will say to you afterwards, "Oh, that was great. You know, it was a great play. Whatever you enjoyed, like." But you know inside that you wouldn't be after giving it a hundred percent, and do you know what I mean. And tis, you have to do that because. Everyone that comes in the, the door like is paying everybody to see the performance and that's it. You know, I've been fortunate enough, I've, I've acted on circuit and I've directed now on the circuit and the circuit is basically like a, a competition countrywide where I'm at the drama groups. But you get critiqued and you put on your show and then this expert comes out and he says, any problems with this play or with the direction of it, like, and you go, oh my God. And then he explains himself, and you go home and you lick your wounds, but you learn, right? And you have some of the best actors and the amateur actors in the country, mm. right? Deirdre has done circuit as well. And you have some of the best amateur actors in the country, and you'd see them getting slated. But you go back next year and they come out and done a different play, and they've learned. The people who listen are the people who learn, right? And every day is a school day. I've learned from doing this, I've learned stuff. It isn't just, come on, we have something to do here and we're going to do it and hash a play together and throw it out. That will be rehearsed till it is ready to go on. And if it isn't ready to go on, it won't go on that week. It's, it's, we're put back, we're back a week. Do you know, we're going, we're going to be a week late putting on this play because it's just not right. So they would do that, they would put it off? Oh yeah, we've put off plays before because we just, uh, you know, down to the years like when, well, lots of the time now, like, it's out of our hands, people have got ill during, do you know what I mean, and they might be off for a week or fortnight, the flu or something, do you know what I mean, so they're missing out on their lines, and they can't, obviously, so, and they have to be up to scratch, so they, they want to be 100% as well doing their part, so the play doesn't go on, we often, we often put it back a week until we have it right, and then it'll go on, you know, so that's a good thing. But it's the craft of it as well, it's the taking that character and delving into that character and trying to make that character come alive and be believable for the audience so that they're not actually seeing you on stage they're seeing this person you're portraying but what i found is i recorded my lines and i just played them in the car as it was coming down so i found that to be quite good and it, i think it was martin that said to me because he was saying like oh yeah i record my lines and i was yeah why didn't i think of that before now so like that learning from each other all the time like because even martin was saying he was learning a, he was listening to a french accent like all the time you know, to be a David. <laughs> I don't know, just the, in, in David in the display. I, I loved it. I got into it big time. David, he was the villain. Like I found out that the first night really is such when we did walk out on the stage when I, when I was doing because the second time I came out and that was pretty instant. Like the second time I got on the stage, there was oh, you know, the audience were there and there was a bit of a and I said, "Geez, you know, this, I'm a villain here." Like, but. Uh, so I enjoyed that then, and then maybe hemmed it up a bit more, but, um, but it seemed to work anyway, so it was, it was very enjoyable to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 
You're just good to take instruction now in fairness. And that's the other secret for the for the actors. It's easy to come in then as the outsider as well. Because people who might normally be that fast to learn their lines, they're just very good to learn lines. So when you come on three rehearsals in and somebody has all the lines off, everyone else kind of sharpens their pencil and says, I better get up my, you know. And then I come in and I say something. Tyg is here for the last 20 years, he might say something. They say, ah, yeah, I might do that. I come in and I say, yeah, look, come in that door. They come in that door. Only because it's a fresh pair of eyes or whatever. It's very easy to be the fixer. But once they get used to me, they won't listen to me either. And it's interesting to see where it will take you on stage as well, because when you read the script, first of all, you mightn't know what you're going to end up doing on stage. And sometimes you'll come to a rehearsal and I don't personally give it a lot of thought until I'm actually on stage with the script and we'll see what happens then. You know, you get a privilege of, of becoming a character for a certain period of time. A writer has to write the character and then the director helps you interpret it and then you're actually there playing it. You brought it to a concrete conclusion, you know, by playing it there. And that's a privilege. So you're aware that there has to be those other people in order for you to do the thing that you love to do. The day you have the script in your hand and you say, right, I will direct this, the director holds all the power. He then hands out, he casts and he says, right, you're playing the 15-year-old gymnast, you're playing whatever, right? You give out. And then as they develop and they own the character a bit, right, the director has less to take it into their own hands. So when we come to tonight, I have no power. I'm sitting up there, I can say, oh yeah, all the lights, do this, do that, right? But they can, I wasn't here last night and they did it probably better than they did it, to do it when I'm here. Mm. So from that point of view, I'm really here tonight to see the show and enjoy it. Because any notes I make, I'm going to make any difference unless we put it on again anyway. So, but what I'm saying is, a director has all the power at the start, and by the time you get to the stage, the actors own the play. But tonight should be our present to our director. Do you know what I mean? Our present is the performance as he has interpreted it way back eight we are nine weeks ago, that as actors we own the play now, it's our play, he's directed it and we're giving him the present of the completed play as directed by him. So yeah. it's our present Thank back you. to him. Yeah, you want to go and be learning your lines. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I think really Ireland has changed in the last 20 years in a big way because I remember putting on Sharon's Grave, which was a John V. Keane play, and coming out of the church in Valentia, a woman congratulating me with one hand and telling me not to put on those type of plays anymore. Yeah. Our first day when we came back was The Field by John V. Packed the hall in uh, the community centre in Valentia, 743 people were into it. That was our first night within. That was our last night as well because we, it was all done in one night. Like. Now John B, as you'll always have a good night at John B. Yeah. But he's about the only person because he was twisting every play. Yeah. There we found we lost the crowd after two nights, they wouldn't come back anymore. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. And then we decided to do comedies. And from, once we started the comedies, the crowds really picked up. Because people like a laugh. And when they're going home from here every night, they're going home laughing at people that's up there on that stage. It's fantastic, you're in the city, you might speak to your neighbours. Yeah, years, so, I mean, there's yeah, like that. Stuff. Like, we lived in an estate and it was a row of terrace houses and I'd say we hardly spoke to the neighbours, do you know? 
they might pick up a parcel every now and again and that'd be kind of it like whereas like you'd meet your neighbours or even like like they're doing times of snow like I called into neighbours across the road like they were elderly like just to see where they are right like and you know you went in you sat down you were there for an hour and a half sitting down having tea in the chats do you know so like there is a great sense of community and everyone kind of looks out for each other and everyone knows each other then as well like and it's I suppose the fact that we're so rural we're kind of tighter in that respect like because of it yeah but no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's just a healthier lifestyle, yeah. and I feel over here, you're not in a rat race, rushing around like you are in England. Um, don't get me wrong, I love England, it's my <laughs> home birthplace, but it, you know, things are just much more laid back, and mm -hmm. it's like I describe, it's like England 20 years ago, where you would know your neighbours, you'd help your neighbours, where Nowadays, everyone in England is a rat race and you barely know each other. You gain, I suppose, a sense of belonging, in a way. We were, I think, eight years in our house in Northampton. And I think I spoke to three people in that street the whole time. Here, I can go shopping anywhere and you are guaranteed to bump into somebody you know or someone who will know you. You might not know them, but they will know you. <laughs> and have a conversation. It, you feel like you belong in a way a bit more? Yeah. Not really, but I have thought about, like friends of mine are teaching out in Dubai and living the life out there. And then you wonder sometimes, should I have gone even just to go for the experience? But then I suppose like that, I, I thought away from home for years and then I moved back down and then my, we got married, we built a house, so we got settled and then I, 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 I like, I suppose I had my opportunity to go and to whatever way things panned out or played out, it just didn't kind of happen. But not that I regretted or anything like, but like I did, I did have those thoughts saying, yeah, will I go away? Will I teach abroad? And those kind of things. And then when we went to Cork and we went to Mahan Point mm -hmm. and we drove into Mahan Point and I saw B&Q, uh, Comet, uh, Argos. Alfred. I was like, mini Britain! <laughs> he was home. Yeah, when you're talking about struggle of living in a rural community, it, it is sometimes, you just sometimes wish, like I lived in a town when I was living away, like and it was so great, you could p walk to the shop, you could pop out and do this, and you could go to the gym, you could go to swimming pool, you could do, and it wasn't uh, like as much as a hassle to get into the car, drive 20, 30 minutes, or a half an hour, or even an hour, like, you know, to get to places where you want to go. But, I suppose it's just it's just the life you choose. I suppose really, like you you either love it or you hate it. I suppose if we look at say at the wider thing, say in terms of Benty or you mentioned about Benty being a small community, but in the last twenty five years, for example, the local community have done something like four and a half million more projects locally for the community. This being one of them, they've they've done things like for parks, sports fields, playgrounds, walks. Uh, we built an, an in, indoor rest for so every facility, uh, including this, every, every facility is there for, for people. I suppose it's about quality of life for people in a rural area, mm. and and also a big plus in the village. Then is, is the fact we have a, we have a, a local uh, railway station. One, the one facility we have, which is a plus, is we have a railway station, with the train passing, which is a huge plus. The Dublin Cork train go to Kerry, pass through Bantia, which is a, and it stops in Bantia, which is a huge, huge plus. And people have, uh, certainly older people, have come living to Bantia for that reason. They can sit in the train, just back the village and get on the train and go wherever they like. I think that's certainly a plus. You see, Bantia is, right, is rural, but it's still not isolated because you take it, there's a train station, as Dennis said, right? That makes it very accessible. You're only 30 miles from Cork City, 30 miles from Killarney. Mm -hmm about 40 from Limerick. So, I mean, you take it, Mallow is only 12 miles in the road. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you take that, it is, it is the centre of a lot of things, like, mm -hmm. and very accessible. It makes me want to move to Bantier, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, 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 the Bantier has, has been, I suppose, over the years, it has got many awards as, as well, uh, including, for example, uh, a few projects in the area have drawn EIB Better Island Awards. They've drawn National Thai Towns uh, Sustainable mm -hmm. Development Award for, for, the, for this facility, actually, in 2009. Um, they won the All-Ireland Pride Place Award in 2007. Mm -hmm. 
So it is a bit right. stand out. It's, it, yeah, I mean, it, is, it uh, must be a bit proud. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, well, oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I suppose it's basically it's all down to the to the effort of voluntary people. We over the last 25 years, there has been a very strong ethos of, of of voluntary work and voluntary support. We're passing through, so our generation are doing a bit for the next generation. So hopefully, right. hopefully, hopefully, by doing all these things, like having yeah. all these things, yeah. then the quality of life for for everyone, from families to to all the people, is is better in the community. I must say, I'm only one of the people, there's a lot of people that do a lot of work more than me. And Con, my brother, is, does, has been doing the PR side of it for years. Rory Driscoll is the chairman, the bar, and there's different people. There's, a, there's not that many, there's about 12, 10, 12 people, all working voluntary. They love the place, and there's a fire in the, in the bar, you've probably have seen it, an open fire. We, we are a very welcoming people, no big deal. If you are in the community, you have to give something towards it. If everyone did nothing, you'd have nothing. It's because of hard work and commitment from people to do it. And if you have, if you have that commitment, you're going to wind up with nothing. Mm -hmm. Whereas you have, you get the facilities that you have, then the different things, whatever they are, be it a theater, be it a sports field, be it a gym, be it whatever it is. Everyone involved here is, is involved in a voluntary basis because it wouldn't sustain us if we had to pay people. So I suppose I'd like to take this opportunity in, in thanking all the people we say, from those who park the cars outside the parking attendants, the ushers inside here, the bar staff, everyone is voluntary. And they give up their time in fairness, and they, I, I, I think they enjoy it as well, to be honest about it. And then, of course, we have to thank our patrons. We have very loyal and true patrons who come here on a regular basis. I mean, we see them for different shows, and in quite a variety of shows. There's one lady up mm. the road, like, and she, she never misses a, um, a drama or, 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 or a singer mm. here. She, she's 92 years of age and she, she right. comes, comes every night. Yeah. That's she right, yeah. Night, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She supports. She yeah. does, yeah. Yeah, yeah, loves it. Herself and her family. Yeah, loves it, yeah. That's right, yeah. yeah. And on top of that, then, this is just not for shows and that. This centre is also, or the Lenti is also used for uh, meetings. Local meetings or community meetings, you want to call them, mm -hmm. our local community council, now district council, we always meet here. Uh, the afters of a funeral. Funnily enough, now people use this venue mm -hmm. and they might bring in caterers and then they have the, they have the premises if the, you know, for the afters of a, of a funeral within the, the community. We, we have a bar, by the way. Did I mention there's a bar in it? And the bar is a vital, a vitally important place. No, it is, though, because what happens after every concert, I would say every event, really, mm -hmm. people go back into the bar. And if after a, an artist, a singing artist is there, more than likely, it'll wind up with some kind of a sing-song. Somebody will start the song, or somebody will do MC for the night, and they'll call on somebody to sing, and that'll lead to somebody else. And you can have a good sing-song often, often after uh, an event here. Mm -hmm. If somebody was seeing this, um far overseas and uh, they were thinking about their trip to Ireland and maybe they're in the States or they're somewhere else, why should they come maybe to volunteer and why should they come and see something in the Grand Theatre? Well they should definitely look it up in here and if there's something they feel they might like, come along and we'll guarantee them a good, good welcome, a good night, good drink in the bar <laughs> and if they feel like singing, well let them sing as well. Yeah, Alright? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no matter, uh, uh, Martin or uh, from Kentork, there's a couple of miles in the road here from this theatre. And um, I work in a local factory there doing electrical work. And, um, I was 27 plus in years of age. And, um, big time, big time. I'm glad she bought my ticket. <laughs> <laughs> it was a delight. Everything, every minute was a surprise. Every sound was a surprise. And it was so fast. Yeah, it was very brilliant. fast. Yeah. Really good.